food. We all need it. And over the millennia, humanity has honed its ability to prepare, create, and cook a good meal. Throughout the centuries, however, what exactly constitutes a good meal has changed. A lot. Did you know that pizza wasn't always cheesy? That chocolate wasn't always solid? And jello? Oh god, jello used to look so bad. Clearly, I got curious. So come with me as I cook some food the way it originally was. If I don't give myself food poisoning, it'll be a miracle. Renaissance Pizza Do you reckon there's anything more American than grabbing a hot slice of pepperoni pizza? Well, first off, pizza is Italian. I hope you at least knew that. But secondly, pizza's much older than you think. In fact, the first use of the word pizza was in 997 CE. I won't be going that far back, though. Instead, I'll be making one of the pizza recipes passed down to us by Bartolomeo Scappi back in 1570. Scappi was, by many accounts, the world's first celebrity chef, cooking for several popes before publishing his recipe book. Scappi provides a few different recipes for pizza in this book. Since one such recipe was already prepared by Max Miller over on Tasting History, and because I'm a masochist, I went with the most un-pizza-y one I could. So, what are the ingredients? Oh, you know, the usual. One cup of almonds, three quarter cup of pine nuts, seven or eight figs, ten dates, half a cup of raisins, eight or so biscotti biscuits, six eggs, three quarter a cup of granulated sugar, butter, and around three quarters of a cup of rose water in your choice of pie shell. Yeah, as it turns out, Renaissance pizza is a lot more dessert-like than I thought. You'll also need a mixing bowl, pie tin, whisk, food processor, egg yolker, along with a mortar and pestle. Start by grounding up your biscotti, or other similar biscuit, in your mortar. We'll be using a food processor later, but the recipe makes a point that you do this separately. So, I am. Plus, it's kind of satisfying. Now it's time to get blending. If you're a hardcore historian and have the day free, you can do this with your mortar and pestle, but I'm just going to use the food processor. Now, Scopi was often cooking for large audiences, so I've reduced the size of the recipe. Don't worry, though. Me from the future knows it turns out great. Begin shredding the figs, raisins, dates, almonds, and pine nuts in your food processor. And do this in batches, as these ingredients get extremely thick and sticky when ground up. You might even need to shake it to get an even blend. Just look at that. Progressively add your gooey concoction to your mixing bowl, and make sure you give it a nice, thorough mix. Once that's done, add in your rose water. Next, we're going to need the yolks from our six eggs. Leave the whites. Okay, this yoker was obviously no good. Uh, this is a little embarrassing. Look, I had a bad time with the yolks, okay? Let's cut ahead. Ah, perfect. Next up, melt three tablespoons of butter in a frying pan. Then add the yolks, sugar, and butter to a bowl and mix thoroughly. Next up, get your pie tin and place in a puff pastry shell of your choice. Obviously, you can make your own, however, Scopi himself didn't care much about this part, so I went with the easiest option. Spread your concoction throughout the tin as evenly as you can. Pat it down and try to get it as flat and equal as possible. Nice. Place into an oven preheated to 400 degrees and bake for 10 minutes. Then lower the temperature to 320 and bake for another 30 minutes. Keep a close eye on your pizza. One way to see if it's done is to stick a knife into the center. If the blade comes out clean, it's probably done, or at least close to done. It'll also start to smell like Christmas. Oh, look at that gorgeous deep dish pizza. Now let's take a slice. Oh, beautiful. Imagine if modern pizzas were still this thick. Now let's give it a try. Wow, the flavors here are lovely, but incredibly rich. I wouldn't recommend big bites of this one. 
The rose water adds a really nice, subtle floral touch to the pie that complements the fruity, nutty base as well. As weird as it may seem, pizza looked more like this than its modern, cheesy variety until the 19th century, when more savory, flat pizzas caught on. Still, I think this Renaissance pizza is totally delicious, if a little thick. Mmm, kinda makes me wonder what a mashup between Scoppy's Pizza and today's might look like. Well, I guess the last question is, is it more of a pizza than one with a pineapple on it? If you think it is, yes, hit that like button. If it's a no, hit subscribe. All done? Right, well, all that dessert got me in the mood for lunch. Aztec Hot Chocolate Where would we be without chocolate? By which I mean, where would I be? I'm probably 30 pounds lighter and a whole lot less happy. But did you know that despite our fondness for this sweet, smooth, creamy candy, chocolate actually traces its roots back to at least 1500 BCE in Mesoamerica? It didn't come in convenient bar form either, but it was a thick, gooey drink. The Aztecs in particular had a strong affinity for the stuff. Far from a simple treat, however, the Aztecs believed that chocolate, or chocolatl, was a gift from the winged serpent god Quetzalcoatl. The Aztecs enjoyed their chocolate with reverence in the form of a cold drink flavored with hot spices, which is interesting because I am a wimp when it comes to spices, so let's put it to the taste test. For this recipe, you'll need 90 grams of 100% dark cocoa powder, 1 teaspoon of chili flakes, 1 teaspoon of achiote powder, and 2 cups of water. If you want to add some sweetness, avoid regular white sugar. I'd recommend 1 to 2 tablespoons of raw cane sugar, which has a distinct taste. If you can't find 100% cocoa powder, you can substitute in high percentage dark chocolate. Leave it in the refrigerator or freezer, then grate it into a powder before cooking. To go along with my chocolate, I'll also be making some popcorn using some popping kernels. We'll get into why later. To prepare, you'll need a couple of pots or saucepans, a whisk, and some measuring equipment. Begin by adding water to the pot and heating on a medium temperature. After a minute or two, add the cocoa powder and give it a stir. Add the sugar at this point if you're using it and stir it in. Then, add a spoonful of chili flakes. Yes, I know, but trust me. Then add your achiote powder. Bring the mixture to a boil. Once it begins to bubble, reduce the heat and stir as the concoction becomes nice and thick. Yeah, that's the stuff. While you may be tempted to guzzle your hot chocolate down now, that wouldn't be authentic, as the Aztecs would typically consume the drink cold. And while you're waiting for your chocolate drink to cool down, consider making yourself a nice bowl of popcorn. While it may seem like a super modern snack, evidence of popcorn cobs in Mesoamerica actually dates back around 6,000 years. The Aztecs didn't just eat the stuff, though. They decorated with it, making garlands, necklaces, and ceremonial headdresses. A lot of people will recommend you use a little oil in the pot when making popcorn, but you don't need to, and it's certainly not what the Aztecs would have done. They popped their kernels in vessels placed on hot coals, or sometimes just on the coals themselves. If you don't have any coals lying around, don't worry. Your pot with a lid on medium-high will do just fine. Listen to that. Apparently, Aztecs would call the sound of popping kernels Toto Poca. Kind of sounds like it, huh? After a few minutes, it should be finished up and beautiful. All right, now our chocolate's cooled down. It's time for a taste test. See how thick it is? Bottoms up. <coughs> Mother of... <coughs> so... <clears throat> For starters, it's way spicier than you might think. Just a teaspoon of achiote and chili goes a long way. It's also really thick, closer to a sauce than a drink. For all my inability to handle spice, though, it's got a wonderful flavor, and I'd recommend giving it a try with and without the cane sugar. Just steer clear if you can't handle your spice. Thick chocolate means it sticks to your tongue. Please, milk... I beg. Aspic. When I was a kid, nothing made me happier than a bowl of jello. 
The color, the sugar, the jiggle. It was pure joy to a hyperactive kid, but what if I told you there was a time in recent history when you might have found onions, ham, or even shrimp in your jello? This is an aspic, and in 1950s America, it was all the rage. Thanks to the advent of instant jello in 1897, combined with the production boom of the 1950s, which spurred on industrious and disturbed American minds. For several decades, jellies with meat and vegetables were frequently served as main courses and were seen as a novel and impressive dish. While this may sound crazy, aspects likely predate dessert jello. A 10th century Arabic cookbook even contains a recipe for seafood aspic. Similarly unappealing, meaty jellos were enjoyed by English monks in the 13th century England. Despite the storied history they enjoyed up until the 1980s, aspics died out in popularity. Let's find out if that was unfair, shall we? There are many aspic recipes from the 50s that survive, but the one we're using will require two packets of instant gelatin, two cartons of tomato juice, some cooked prawns, a tomato, an onion, a bell pepper, a head of lettuce, Worcestershire sauce, and salt. For equipment, you'll need a mixing bowl, whisk, ladle, cutting board, measuring cups, a pot, and a mold for your jello. Begin by chopping one onion, one pepper, and one tomato into bite-sized chunks. Set these chopped veggies to the side for now. Don't worry about cooking them, they go in raw. Okay, maybe do worry about that. Next, add one cup of water to a mixing bowl before pouring in two packets of gelatin. Then mix thoroughly until you end up with a sludge. Next up, add a cup and a half of tomato juice to a pot and bring to a simmer. Follow that with half a cup of water. Whisk together. Next up, add around a teaspoon of Worcestershire sauce, whisk. Next, get your gelatin mixture, which should be looking hard and hearty, and spoon it into the pot. Then whisk thoroughly, until it's incorporated fully into the liquid. Add one more cup of tomato juice and whisk. Bring this concoction to a boil for a few minutes to make sure the gelatin completely dissolves. Remove from the heat and once cooled, pour into the bottom of your mold. At this point, just fill it up to maybe the bottom fifth or so. Place your mold in the refrigerator for a couple hours and voila, we have the foundations for our monstrosity. Now it's time to get creative. Add your chopped pepper, onion, tomato, and pre-cooked shrimp into the mold in whatever way pleases you most. Remember, you'll be pouring more liquid over this though, so eh, try to space it out a little. Pour more of your concoction into the mold, making sure it seeps into every nook and cranny. Leave the bottom third or quarter of your mold for now, and just place it back in the refrigerator for another few hours, or overnight for best results. When it's solid, begin this process for the final time. I place my lettuce at the bottom like a nice bed of greens, but how you arrange everything is up to you. Pour in more gelatin juice, put it back in the refrigerator, and then remove a couple of hours later. Jiggle your creation from your mold and congratulations, a complete aspic. Dang, look at this thing. I'm honestly surprised it turned out as well as it did. Well, structurally speaking at least, because let's be honest, it looks nasty. Oh well, time to go ahead and give it a taste. Mm. Blah, blah. You know, my taste buds just about accept the tomato juice jello. The peppers and onions aren't awful either. It's essentially just like a salad suspended in tomato juice. Not to my taste, but not revolting until you hit a shrimp, that is. My mouth straight up rejected that bite. The flavor, texture, cold temperature gel together in a really unappealing way. So would I recommend making an aspic? Nope. It's fun, and the jiggly final product is satisfying, but, um, bleh. It truly was disgusting. Oh, and it takes hours to finish. You know what? Take that, Aspic. Garum. Every house, restaurant, and school I've ever been to has a bottle of tomato ketchup. It's a universal condiment. One study reported that an average American consumed 71 pounds of ketchup every year. 
For people like me, it's probably more. Still, as popular as the stuff is today, there's one ancient sauce that has it beat. Garum. The ancient Romans were absolutely crazy about this sauce. They ate it with fish, drizzled it on salad, flavored their porridge with it, dunked pastries into it. They even made sub-sauces out of this stuff, mixing it with wine, vinegar, and honey. It's also famously kind of gross. Garum is made from fermenting fish guts that stank so bad, ancient laws decreed factories producing the stuff could only be located on the outskirts of towns. Seneca of Hispania called garum the extract of poisonous fish that burns the stomach with its salted putrefaction. So, definitely an acquired taste. Let's try it. Fortunately, I didn't have a few months to wait around for my fish to ferment, as cook J.M. Van Winter in her 1976 cookbook, Van Soter Koken, found a way to speed up the process. To prepare this sauce, you'll need three or four cans of your choice of small fish. I went with pilchard and sardines, a handful of fresh mint, and a whopping 500 grams of salt. To cook, have ready two large pots, a colander, and a roll of paper towels. Begin by completely draining any brine from your canned fish, washing the fish with water, then placing them in a large pot. Add enough water to the pot so that the fish is entirely submerged. Place a lid on the pot and bring the contents to a boil. Once the fish is bubbling, add your truly ridiculous amount of salt to the pot, along with your comparatively modest handful of mint. Bring the fish up to a boil once again and let them bubble away for 15 minutes. It's at this point that I should warn you that this is quite possibly going to be the stinkiest thing you've ever cooked. Be ready for the smell of salty fish to linger in your house, on your clothes, and in your hair for weeks. Sorry, I didn't lead with that. Lower the pot to a simmer and, using your implement of choice, mash the fish into a fine pulp. Really go to town on that fish. By this point, the bone and muscle should be uh, soft and easily crushed. Don't worry about mashing up every last morsel, though. Some chunks are fine. Once you're done, bring the pot back up to a boil and leave for another 20 minutes. Oh god, I really can't downplay the smell here. At one point when I was making this, I'm pretty sure I heard a stray cat going crazy outside my window. Let me remind you once again that the Romans put this on pastries. We have our donuts with jam. They have them with rotten fish juice. After about 20 minutes, your garum should have begun to thicken. Place your colander over a second pot and pour your disgusting fishy broth into it. At this point, you can either toss the fish chunks or blend them and add them back into the pot before bringing it to a boil and repeating this process. At this point, we do want to remove every chunk we can, so line your colander with strong paper towels, place over the original pot, and pour in the contents. Repeat the process of lining your colander with paper towels and transferring the liquid back and forth between the two pots several more times. The more you do this and the more chunks you remove, the better. I did this four times, but I could have done more. The chunks were telling. Once you're done, transfer your garum into a bowl for dunking or bottle for storage. All right, time for a taste test. I'm gonna dunk some bread. And when I say this is saltier than a spoonful of salt, I'm not kidding. The intense salty flavor hits in waves. At first it was strong, but then after 10 seconds, the lingering taste was so intense, I had to eat a handful of mint. No idea what the mint is doing in there, by the way, because it's undetectable. All right, so when I said that the Romans had this with everything, I wasn't kidding. It's pastry time. Am I really gonna do this? Oh my god, oh, it's so gross. The fishy saltiness on the sweet bread is just, no, absolutely not. Ah, where's the vomitorium? Ah. Banana ham hollandaise. You know, the 70s were a weird time. There was a clash between hippiedom and traditionalism, and perhaps no demographic was hit harder by the confusing era than suburban housewives. 
How else do you explain dishes from the era like the frankfurter and corn casserole, tomato mayonnaise chutney, sardine and egg canapes, and the meal we're preparing today? Banana ham hollandaise. This treat comes to us courtesy of McCall's Great American Recipe Card Collection. McCall's was a woman's magazine that, at the height of their popularity, enjoyed an annual readership of 84 million people. In the 70s, they produced a series of recipe cards featuring the previously mentioned abominations. And it's where we find today's recipe. For this dish, you'll need eight medium-sized bananas, eight slices of ham, two packets of hollandaise sauce mix, lemon juice, mustard, and single cream. To prepare, make sure you have a frying pan, oven-proof baking tray, and oven-proof baking paper. Begin by lining your tray with paper. Next up, peel all your bananas and place them on the tray. Hot tip here, bananas are actually easier to peel if you pinch them at the end rather than pulling on the stem. After this, drizzle a little lemon juice on each side of your bananas. This prevents them from drying out too much while baking. Next up, begin the process of taking a slice of ham, spreading a little mustard onto it, then wrapping it around a banana. If your ham is on the thicker side, like mine was, this might prove a little finicky, but uh, you'll get there. Once you've wrapped every banana up tight, place them in the center of an oven and bake for 10 minutes at 400 degrees. In the meantime, let's get to work on the hollandaise sauce. In a frying pan, add one cup of water, a quarter cup of cream, or uh, thereabouts in my case. Then add both envelopes of hollandaise mix to the pan. Beautiful. Bring to a simmer and mix it all together. I ended up transferring to another pot to avoid splash damage. Before too long, it'll start to get nice and thick. Honestly, mine probably got a little too thick here. So, consider adding a little more cream or water to yours. Once the bananas have been baked for 10 minutes, remove them from the oven and begin generously applying your sauce. It's at this point, when the pale goo slopped onto the hammy bananas, that the unappealing nature of this dish really began to set in. If you were a kid growing up in the 70s, man, my heart goes out to you. Imagine coming home from school to this. Once you're done, place back in the oven and bake for a further five minutes. Once that's done, remove and behold. As you can probably tell, my morsels look a little on the burnt side. This might be because many modern ovens heat faster than those from the 70s. But I didn't take that into account during the preheating process. So when you no doubt try this recipe at home, try to keep that in mind. Well, let's give this abomination a taste, shall we? Hmm. Hmm. Nope. I kept looking for something here to like. I mean, the baked ham and mustard works together, obviously, but the uh, sweet lemony banana and hollandaise just doesn't gel. It doesn't taste like a cohesive meal at all, more like several things that are slamming together in my mouth. It's also really hard to get a forkful, as you can see. Overall, this recipe didn't go well. My sauce was too thick, my ham wasn't wrapped as well as it could have been, and I think they went in the oven a little too long. Still, I get the feeling that even if everything had turned out perfectly, this wouldn't be a dish I'd be dying to try again. Roman bread salad. Kinda. And speaking of things that didn't go well, here's one final disaster. Ancient Roman bread salad. This intriguing recipe comes to us from a 5th century Roman cookbook, though it was likely eaten even earlier. It describes what I thought was an unusual kind of sandwich comprised of herbs, garlic, honey, cheese, oil, vinegar, and water sprinkled over bread with the crusts removed. What I made turned out fairly tasty, but it was also completely wrong. You see, smart guy I am, I decided I'd just try to follow the recipe in the original Latin. While I thought the recipe was telling me to remove the crusts of the bread, discard them and apply the mixed seasoning, it was actually telling me to do the opposite. Remove the crusts, use them to make crumbs, and discard the rest of the bread. So I made the dang thing completely wrong. Now, could I have seen this coming based on the fact that I don't speak Latin? Uh, yeah. 
Were updated English versions of the recipe available online? Also, yeah. You know what, though? I wouldn't feel honest if I didn't share my failures with you, so yes, I made a weird wet bread thing no one on earth had ever eaten before. Honestly, though, wasn't half bad. And there we are, five dishes from history. Some resounding successes, others enormous failures. Which of these meals would you like to try? Or maybe you've tried to make some of these yourself? Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching.